Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Drat and Drake Veterinary Podcast, episode 17 at this point. We're approaching 20. Wow. All right. This podcast <laughs> is about to be able to buy some cigarettes for the next one. Why well, would you? <laughs> That's true. It's terrible for you. <laughs> well, boys and girls. Come up with you come well, up cigarettes. well, I didn't, I don't want to make things like, you know, there's obviously I mean, something else that come, came to mind, but I didn't want to go there. So. It's the beautiful smoke. Oh, maybe like one drag. Like really? When I was like wow. 19 in college, because I wanted to see how it, how it was. I know, right? <laughs> Risky. It's so, yeah, I know. I mean, no, no I, I don't know if I have an addictive personality. I, I, I would say no. I don't know but if it depends on your personality, though, I feel like. I think, no, there's a, there's a genetic thing that based like it's genetically what implant implied it genetically it's in your genes to be more susceptible to addiction right like from a behavioral sense but i feel like negative no. addiction overrides any personality trait i would assume well then that would explain no because there's difference of people there's differences between people who can quit cigarettes and there are people who can't but are you telling me that there are people out there that could say glay and they could try to get addicted to cigarettes and just I don't think that exists. Uh, I've never seen like anyone if try to get addicted, but like if yeah. you give them a month to keep smoking cigarettes to try to get done it, I don't think there's a human out there that could be addicted to cigarettes at that point. This, I guess, but anyway, I think I'm not how that became our intro. There, no, there's gotta <laughs> moral of the story: don't smoke. No, there, there's gotta yeah, be. Don't smoke kids. There's got to be a genetic, like, um, like in your DNA, how many nicotine receptors you have too, though, right? Unless it's like, does it like oh, override, sure. does it override dopamine? Does it have the same thing? And therefore, like, that's why it just, I actually have no idea how this works. Yeah, um, I don't know anything about okay. All right, cigarette well, addiction. But. Moving on. Um, so today's episode is going to be a little bit different, but I'm pretty excited to talk about it just because it's a little different. Let's mix things up. Uh, I was, I'm a big YouTuber, so... I have YouTube premium, which those who watch more than one video a day on YouTube, I think it's worth every penny. Not to say that it's not like every subscription now is ridiculous and it costs money, which is frustrating. But instead of being cut off with ads on this video that you want to watch, it's now you don't have any ads and it's worth to me. It's worth it. It's life changing. Once you get it, you can't go back. YouTube premium, not sponsored, unfortunately. Very use ad block. <laughs> it's, it's, well, no, I have it on my TV. You can't, you can't add uh, one on TV. Yeah. Well, don't watch YouTube on your TV. Well, but th that's what we do. You know, my <laughs> wife and I will like after, after a long day, baby's asleep, we'll go on this, we know, we'll sit down in front of the TV and we'll watch YouTube on it. And that's just, that's what you do now. I guess that's, you know, I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, the cost of YouTube print is relatively oh. low. Oh yeah. I mean, it's cheaper but, than my light bill for sure. And all the yeah. other things that I use. I think cigarettes. it's still like 10 or 12. <laughs> it's it's way, way cheaper than my cigarettes, which apparently have <laughs> harsher drugs in them. <laughs> so I was watching, I was watching YouTube and something came up. I, I have like an occasional, you know, a lot of things I watch are like cooking stuff. Uh, my wife and I watch Good Mythical Morning, uh, tech stuff, of course. Um, but one occasional I'll get some uh, basketball. Occasionally, I'll get some science-related stuff, and there was one that caught my eye because of the the thumbnail and the clickbait titles that people like to have, and it had to do with mosquitoes. And I, I mean, you know, we talked a little about this before the episode, of course, but and so I, it, it'd be unfair for me to say I don't know about you, Remington, but mosquitoes are kind of the bane of my existence. I know, right? I, I think it's like a known. I'm pretty sure a majority, and I could confidently say this without any statistical knowledge, uh, but at least 90% of cognizant people who have encountered mosquitoes can tell me that can tell me that you do not like mosquitoes. Right? There's no one out there who's like, man, I don't know, dude. Mosquitoes, those are <laughs> I don't think anyone likes mosquitoes. I think the only people that like I feel like the people that research mosquitoes still don't like them. They find them interesting. Well, they but research it's probably them. to research them to get rid of them. Exactly. <laughs> right. And that kind of goes into what the video I came across. Um, so essentially it's, they and were it focused. The Mark Rubber video. No. And I, you, you know, shout out. There was Mark. 
it, no, it, it was it's someone else. It was okay because he's done a lot of cool videos. I got to mm-hmm. give a shout out to him too. He he Maybe he's very he's really fun. Hmm? Maybe it's very tassier. There was one of like the major science YouTubers that recently did like a mosquito thing. I, actually, I think it was very tassier. Yeah, but, I should. I should. Yeah, it, it, then it goes into it how much. One. Yeah, I bet you know because they probably did a heck of a lot more research than we did. <laughs> this episode. Oh, he was like getting bit by them and all that. Yeah, it was. It was Mark Rober. The whole thing. It was. I saw that one. Oh, too. really? Yeah. He 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 was in the yeah. He went to the lab right, and they did all that stuff. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he also did a bed bug one, which was disgusting. Maybe it was bed bugs. Maybe it was bed bugs instead of mosquitoes. I I might have seen that one actually some years ago, but the of course now this goes into the topic of you know yeah, how the, yeah oh, okay I think I might have seen it, but. The, the topic of now how they eradicate or how they're trying to eradicate or control mosquito populations, obviously for more second or third world countries because of the incredible amount of disease it spreads. Um, for me, actually, Remy, why don't you tell me, what's your personal experience with mosquitoes? Is this more of like a personal vendetta on my end or do you? Um, I think you definitely have a, a higher hatred of mosquitoes than I do. <laughs> I mean, part of it is I've been lucky that you know, I haven't lived in super mosquito heavy areas for a lot of my life, but like, even when I have, I feel like I'm not a prime target for them. Oh, like if they're more opportunistic around me, right? Like if I'm sure. there and no one else is there, then sure. But like, I'm not, I'm not the, you're not uh, their prime. Not the, okay. The, the yeah, prime I'm, top I'm shelf human. That's me. The... I'm top shelf stuff, man. <laughs> I think it has to do with like carbon emissions. I think they're very attracted to CO2 and I don't know. I guess I just like her. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say fart a lot, but that's methane, isn't it? Not CO2. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I was lucky in my childhood in the Bay Area to not be around a lot of mosquitoes. I remember my first encounter with mosquitoes. I was sleeping and suddenly um, I woke up to something on my lip. And then but your first ever encounter, you remember it? Of my memory, yeah. It's, it was, wow. So what happened was I ended up I woke up in the, I was actually sleeping in my sister's room. I was like, it was, it, I was eight or nine years old. And I woke up to a bug and like, I didn't even know it was a bug, but I felt something on my lip and I woke up to it and I, I saw a bug and I saw blood, right? I was like, oh, over the course of the next 12 hours, my lip just swelled up like crazy. And, you know, and then it was like another 10, 15 years until I saw another mosquito because it just isn't very common in that pocket of the Bay Area that I that I grew up in. And then the next time I, I saw one was when I was camping in college. Um, now, not to go into race, but Asians don't camp. All right. But that, that's a general statement. But if you talk to mo- we we will check it out. But like, you know, and there are some that I've known who go who do Boy Scouts, but we're not you don't see a lot of us go out there and have a lot of experience at least back in the 90s and 2000s nowadays you might see a lot more you know asian americans or you just asians in general doing it but my friends and i invite them to camping and we finally they opened up hey they opened (laughs) up the borders for us man it's great (laughs) but my me and my group of friends we weren't big campers so i very limited experience we don't know about bug spray i never had to wear it so i go in and i wake up in the middle of the night and I have literally 20 plus bites, welts on my shins. And for the next six months, it's developed such significant scar tissue on my legs where I had to apply steroid cream on it quite frequently because of the itch. It was such a severe reaction. And steroids cause darkening or pigmentation on your skin. So for months, I would just have these circular welts all over both of my shins. And I remember that because I would, that was the time when I started playing a lot of pickup basketball in college and I'd have to roll my socks up all the way up to my knees because I was kind of embarrassed by it. So fast forward over you to- You were embarrassed by that. Huh? <laughs> you weren't embarrassed by <laughs> uh, rolling your socks up there. The, the higher your socks are in basketball, the better of a baller you are. Everyone knows oh, that. Okay. Please. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so fast forward now to vet school. You know, and again, I say this in every episode, I'm a Caribbean student. I went to Ross. Uh, class 2018 and the caribbean is definitely a place that breeds and has mosquitoes right same with florida so that was a big thing for me 
And I had to deal with that on a daily basis. It got to the point where I, you know, the, I had to buy insecticides where I would wake up in the morning, spray my entire room, like a whole can of it, close my door. And I only went into my room just to, just to sleep because I did, I couldn't sleep with any, like any single mosquito that buzzed around my ear. I wouldn't be able to sleep for the night, especially if, you know, if I had an exam the next day, it's just, that's game over. Right. Um, they have like these un us like it's illegal to buy in the us they have like these things that they sell there and that's what i would use every day i have no idea what it's done to me long term but that's like there's such a the, yeah, yeah i was gonna say do you know why it's illegal <laughs> i was looking it up so before this episode i looked it up i had a, I, I couldn't find anything i think a lot of it isn't so much the ingredients but i think just the company that's based in the caribbean they didn't apply for the epa eligibility eligibility in the us so, so it's not like it causes no i'm actually kind of just bsing about it but it's it's the reason why it's not allowed it's just because regulations not because of well i i mean who knows who I, I didn't really go deep into like the percentage of those active ingredients but anyways i i, I there's i probably cut You're off the years of my life i'm here now we'll see how long it lasts um yeah i mean i, I there was a there's a science to it at a point where if i can handle it my, my mental health can handle 10 bites active itchy bites if there's any more than that my mood dramatically changes and i'm a very very unhappy person so that's my personal experience i think there's people in the world who have it a lot worse than me with mosquitoes because we're know. not going to go super yeah, that's the that's the worst <laughs> i've ever heard i know right i've never heard of anyone that uh, well number one it was kind of weird that you had like this one solitary experience yeah. with a mosquito and it stood out in your memory enough to remember from all that time later but the fact that you still had those welts as long as you did I i've never known anyone else to have them that long thank you remy like which I mean, thank you you take first place now i, I like some other it's a it's a thing in life where i've learned that people you know they don't want advice they don't want answers they just want to be heard and they want their feelings to be acknowledged and <laughs> i feel heard and i feel acknowledged that's like that's all that matters you know um and, and yeah it's i mean your, your mosquito therapy yeah. session but, you know, obviously mosquitoes are kind of a hor a pretty horrible animal in the world. Yeah, they're not great. No, they, but, you know, again, y y these are things people know, but obviously they cause malaria, West Nile, dengue, yellow fever, uh, Zika was a big thing in the Caribbean, chikungunya, a lot of my, call my, my classmates at Ross Scott, um, and of course in the veterinary field, we have heartworm. Uh, looked up some statistics online. This one was, I think, statistics.com. <laughs> but in 2022, there were reported about a million deaths from mosquitoes in just that year. All right. Second place, snakes at 100,000. All right. Um, third That's place. more than I would have asked. I actually thought so too. I was a little surprised. I would have thought much less than that. So who knows? Um, Which, 20 uh -huh. I mean, that really begs the question, like, how, how are these stats aggregated, right? Is it just yeah. someone who posted on whatever forums and someone else found it and then put it on Wikipedia and, then, you know, like, it's just self-referential at that point. May, but, yeah, because, I mean, it's, I, I feel like most places that have people that might die from mosquitoes or snakes are probably, they don't have the resources to accurately or consistently report those deaths either. So they're, these are obviously estimates or else it wouldn't be a, a rounded sure. number like 100,000. Um, yeah, I would have put the order of magnitude like 1,000. Yeah. Right, not 100,000. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Third place. Now that's a, that's a bit of it. We started getting into the, some of these wild cards here. Um, third place is dogs at 30,000 deaths a year. And I, you know, I kind of believe that just because being visiting you know countries that aren't like america where our dogs are our, practically our children and you have people who are like not they don't want anything to do with dogs i know this is kind of a, a, a bit of a reality check where you know we're still animals and people in america might get offended by someone not hating not liking or hating dogs but it's probably because from their experience from whatever wherever they were from Dogs are killing thirty thousand people a year. You know. Well, do you know if it's if it's all dogs death or if it's you know, only dog attacks or tying rabies from dogs into that? Like, what are you know? Fair, fair question. Um, and I don't know. Then this is this is why we have to kind of take statistics.com with a grain of salt. You know, 
they I, I think they had more sub statistics on each of these, but you had to pay for it. So until we get sponsored for this podcast, I probably won't be putting resources into subscription websites. Yep. <laughs> Top line number. Yeah. And it just we're using this for clickbait anyways. Yeah. Now here's here's another wild card. Um Deer was up there on the list, which didn't expect that either. That is You're, Hundred coming through your windshield, yeah. <laughs> Run into right. I mean, I, I would think maybe moose because aren't those guys significantly larger than deer? Yeah, but still, like, how often? I don't know. I'm like struggling to conceive of how we're going to get to situations where they're getting killed. Yeah, by, by deer. deer. Unless it? you're counting like prion disease. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, other deer crap. But I, I feel like. I don't know, but I mean, again, if we're at a hundred thousand snakes, hundred thousand say bets, I mean, who knows, but who knows? Yeah. I, I think the dog one to me is believable. The mosquito one, I feel like everyone knows at this point. Yeah. You know, just mosquitoes are, it, it's kind of an over affair, but yeah, I wouldn't have put deer on that list. On that list. Yeah. And I, I, it's almost like the person who makes this, this, the statistics has like a personal vendetta against deer because it's like, <laughs> it's a hundred. Like, why are we, why are we putting that on there? You know? <laughs> but I guess it is. So, uh, one thing that I, I calculated very quickly are mosquitoes are 4,000 more times more likely to kill you than a lion is. But how many lions are you running? So, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that mosquitoes are more deadly, you know, and if I were to have, I mean, essentially, if I were to have 250 pet lions versus a million pet mosquitoes, I think it works that way. the equivalence. <laughs> Moving forward, let's go into the actual control method. So, um, the, the, the three points of research that I did here was the CDC the World Mosquito Program, uh, which their website is worldmosquitoprogram.org. And I did a little bit of Wikipedia research. I'll start with the CDC. And this is one that they use Wolbachia. Uh, or not, not, I don't know the CDC, but the, 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 the information that CDC provided from those who are in the con mosquito control research this particular facility or program utilizes Wolbachia to actually sterilize or, uh, sorry, control the population of the mosquitoes. It seems like the males that are infected with Wolbachia, when they mate with the females, the eggs do not hatch and therefore the population is controlled. Reportedly, this has been used in Texas and California. Um, eight, other countries like Singapore, Thailand, Mexico, and Australia have also, I guess, seen success from it. There are some things where you, you have to keep releasing these organisms that are, that are these mosquitoes that are grown in lab, because if you don't, then eventually that population is just going to go back to normal, right? The mosquito population. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that this effectively only works on one mosquito species, the, uh, the Aegypti or the AE Aegypti. So there, I mean, I think there's like over a thousand different species in the world, but that, that is the primary one that spreads the disease. So it's good to, if you had to choose that one. You know, interesting. Yeah, no, before you told me about that, I have no idea. For Crazy. For mosquito oh. control, because I'm sure everyone in the veterinary world knows significant sweat hard work. Yeah. Right? Well, but the story, the story will come full circle. Just, just you wait. Okay. All right. So, um, no, but I mean, it, it's just, I mean, it raises a lot of questions in my mind, right? Like you, number one, I, I wonder how, well, like what went into the decision-making for this kind of population control on mosquitoes, mm -hmm. presumably to, to help, you know, try to minimize, uh, mosquito borne illness in, in humans. Right. But like, if we're taking the route of developing things that need to constantly be um, like the Wolbachian mosquitoes need to be reintroduced consistently to maintain mm -hmm. control. Like why, why is work being 
It seems like that as soon as we stop doing that, it's going to go right back. Was because mm-hmm. you mentioned that there was another one with like the one well, so stained, right? I'll get to that one. Um, and those, I think all of it, all of these techniques, unfortunately don't have like a one-time treatment and then it's just, and then it's just consistent. You have to keep manufacturing these altered mosquitoes and then sending them out into society. But I guess my, my follow-up question to that was, is that an intentional choice that has been made or is that a consequence of the fact that we haven't been able to develop a mm-hmm. sustainable that yet? Yeah, uh, I could see there being hesitation with wanting to completely to introduce something that's going to be long term yeah. in the ecosystem that impacts a core part of it, such as mosquitoes that are eaten by so many other so know, funny enough. In the ecosystem. It, it it actually and this is you know he, this is only just based on a hypothesis, but they they did say they being some entity that I can't list off the top of my head, they mentioned that mosquitoes actually, if we were to eradicate the the big three subspecies of mosquitoes that cause the disease, there's only about like maybe four or five other species that feed off of them. However, in those environments, there's, there's actually other prey that they can survive off of. So mosquitoes really don't have a large impact on our ecosystem. So you're saying specifically if we knock out just these species that are responsible for disease transmission, leaving all the other mosquitoes, we're, we're okay with that's that. currently that Yeah, that's currently like where I would say that. I mean, is there a scenario where if we eradicate all the thousands of different mosquito species, it's going to be okay? I, I, I don't know. I, I would personally be worried about that because who knows, right? I mean, they're, they are such a big part of just, there's so many of them. There has to be some type of impact, but I, I don't know. Well, because they're, I mean, they're not only food, but with the amount of disease that they transmit, they're their own form of population, right? So it's something that I, yeah, I wonder how specific all of these chains, like all of these interventions are for being able to, to treat mosquitoes. Yeah. Like I, you know, if we're coming up with ones that are crossing that species boundary i think that's where it gets a little bit more scary oh yeah can you imagine if it accidentally killed out like armadillos at the same time or or like wolves <laughs> it's like yeah that would be yeah, that that I, I could see why they'd have to be very selective and create these lab grown ones just because anything that would be reproducible in the wild would be very difficult to control what's that what's that old one oh that that old study or that thing where there was like an infestation of, of, of mice. So they brought all these cats and then they had infestation of cats and so they brought all these dogs. So yeah. that becomes a whole thing. Now, a little more interesting here is the, the world mosquito program. And this is kind of, I, I probably where the video that I came across got their information. Uh, they, a lot of their research is done in Brazil. I believe they're also have some funding from the Gates foundation. So shout out to Bill Gates. They also have things in Colombia, Mexico, Honduras, uh, Indonesia, parts of Asia, Australia, and, and, and pretty much around the world. They also use Wolbachia. And this is a little bit of the part that's a little bit weird for me. Can I, I didn't really, I wasn't able to find where this inconsistently goes, but they also affect the males with the Wolbachia. Okay. Um, and when they mate, the mosquitoes are born with the Wolbachia. And those mosquitoes, unlike from what the CDC says, they actually, those offspring are viable. They, they live and they're able to reproduce. What, what ends up happening is that what they see is the Wolbachia infection on all these mosquitoes essentially outcompetes with the other viruses like dengue, malaria, and these mosquitoes become less infectious, therefore decreasing the amount of viral transmission. So. Wolbachia seems to be like the best thing to ever kind of give it <laughs> to give to these bugs. I don't know. It maybe it's like the, uh, you know, the amount of the, the bacteria that then maybe at a certain threshold now the offspring aren't viable or I have no idea, but I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. The concepts of outcompeting 
other diseases within the mosquito is, is an interesting one. I, I guess, yeah, it would, it would be something I would have to learn more on, on how specifically that mechanism yeah. works. I, I mean, it, you, you kind of spoiled the punchline for me, at least in terms of where, where this goes, as far as uh-huh. how other veterinary related things tie into this, but, um, I mean, do you want to just talk about it? All right. Well, so let's, let, let's, let's get into the other sterilization. The line out. No, I'm, I'm, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. So other methods of sterilization. Okay. Which they also have, um, it's, they use radiation. So they, they'll take laboratory grown insects in this case, of course, mosquitoes, they'll shoot them with gamma radiation. Okay. Turn them all into like the Hulk. And they become sterile and they can't reproduce. Uh, this is actually something that we all learned in vet school, right? We had, they, they talk a, a huge thing about the, um, the screw worm. Uh, and that was, those are huge impacts to the, uh, the produce, not the produce, the, uh, livestock industry, just because I think they eat, eat away at the flesh and they're so incredibly aggressive. And if you have one, you literally have to eradicate the entire stock. So they can cause billions of dollars of damage. So. What they did is they would take these lab-grown larvae, shoot them with gamma radiation, sterilize them completely, and then they just they'll re- they'll mate, but they don't just don't create offspring, and then they die off. I don't really know why that was so successful for screwworms, and only just maybe somewhat successful in certain pockets with mosquitoes. I, maybe it's like a numbers thing where screwworms just don't reproduce as aggressively, or efficiently like mosquitoes do but all right i'm gonna jump to the I mean, point so you're, you're having to to breed in captivity a whole bunch of mosquitoes to then introduce them to the population right mm-hmm. so is there a limit i mean i guess from a practical sense that you're having to farm a whole bunch of mosquitoes that yeah like are just contributing to the problem with them. yeah um no but i mean it makes sense that you know you have to have mosquitoes to a ring gate to then introduce the population but yeah, I just, I questioned if there's just so many of them in the life cycle is so short that you're, it's just a numbers thing. Just a numbers thing, maybe. But, All right, let's, let's get, I'm going to get to the point that you wanted me to get to. So another thing, another mechanism that they used uh, is gene manipulation. And essentially they will insert genes into the mosquito uh, DNA, essentially. Uh, this specific gene that I came across is called the OX513A gene. It essentially affects just the males. Okay, again, we the guys tend to be the target here. Um, very quick, females are the ones that bite you. Males don't do it. They're just kind of the, the guys who just give them their Y or X, their extra chromosome, and then they end up reproducing. I don't even know if they have XY chromosomes. Um, what ends up happening is that the offspring are born, however, they, because of this gene, they don't live long enough to mature into adulthood where they can then reproduce. So we'll kind of go back into like the concept of this of when, what's happened in the lab, right? You, you get these males, you affect them with this gene, right? Now you have to reproduce these males to then make more so you can throw them out into the wild. So there's actually this thing where you can, with the males that have this gene, you, if you want them to have viable offspring, you actually have to give them a trigger to turn off that gene and then produce the offspring with that gene. And it's apparently a known thing called the TET off mechanism, TET standing for tetracycline. So what they end up doing is they give these mosquitoes tetracycline or doxycycline to turn off the gene, which ends up manipulating their ability to create offspring. And again, full circle into veterinary medicine. Dr. Drake, I'll let you take over what I'm trying to say here. Well, one of the reasons that we care about doxycycline Lockia is that that's one of the things that we treat during heartburn treatment is doxies, horrible doxies. Right, which is mind blowing, right? That's like, that mind blowing. Part of it. What the wild part is that you're, I mean, it's almost like it, it's it's reversed, right? Like you're you're turning it off by treating with the doxy, which I think is a really cool mechanism. Yeah, uh, I guess it's a Florida thing. 
I'm still learning how things work here, but there's apparently some backyard trick you can do with one of those giant, like three foot fans to control the mosquitoes in your backyard. Oh, I've seen that. And yeah, you put the mesh in front yeah. of it and then, yeah. and the dude was just like, at the end of the day, was dumping piles of mosquitoes and I was blown away. I was like, I, I expected a little bit of mosquitoes, not the whole like leaf pile of mosquitoes. It was insane. And so I'm thinking of like, yeah, I mean, that's just one guy's backyard. Yeah. So spread that out to the, the billions of mosquitoes out there. I don't know. That's a lot of docs. He, he, <laughs> no. So, so obviously they, they only give the doxy in lab to then be able to reproduce it because the thought is mosquitoes can't access doxycycline in the wild, but, but what if they can, <laughs> what if there's a scenario where they end up realizing, oh man, we need this medication to be able to reproduce and they end up finding and like, you know, invading a doxycycline factory. They can. Are they going to join forces with uh, irradiated mosquitoes? It's like Spider-Man, Mosquito yeah. Man. So mosquitoes and Wolbachia, they, they work together and they kind of fight. <laughs> and eventually we're going to find veterinarians and epidemiologists alike fighting to save the world. It's essentially really uh, kind of what the whole be the next Marvel movie. That's going to be the thumbnail um, of this or the title of this, of this podcast. Uh, some tell me they're not going to. I, I don't think so either. No, the people are greedy. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely, for me, ties into kind of the, there's a whole realm that's interesting to dive into, but it's definitely way over, I think, most of our heads in terms of these populational level issues, specifically for like animals in the ecosystem, where we have these tools, like these knockout genes and mm-hmm. strategies for, you know, sterilizing the males of mosquitoes and stuff. Where there's definitely a lot of factors that go into this decision making. And there's definitely areas where you can make decisions that you can't go back on, right? There can be some irreversible things. Um, but we're definitely entering a world where all of the genomic sequencing that we're able to do now, all of the RNA technology that we have, like it, it's opening up a lot of possibilities to, to really say, okay, we'll if we're successful with eradicating disease causing species of mosquitoes. And then, you know, you turn and look at the projects that they're doing with vaccinating, you know, raccoons and stuff against rabies, you know, what other things are, are worth considering and have positive benefits later on that potentially, you know, have relevancy to better things, right? Like, is it something where the recent atypical um cirdc breakout that we us like is that something that hypothetically could there be a a populational solution to to help prevent that from spreading mm-hmm. later on yeah you i know, think a that. lot of it comes down to the the interest and i guess the severity of how it impacts the people who, who'd want to put money into it yeah you know? i mean it definitely becomes it's a little bit harder when it's, you know, you look at like dogs that are owned by families, you know, I, I don't, they're now, now that I'm kind of going into this discussion, I, I think you, you start to cross the gap where it's like, okay, if it's wildlife, that's one thing. If it's pets owned by people, obviously like there's a respect, the whole thing, you, you have to be able to get permission you know, yeah. to want to, to participate in that. So I think that's probably. Now that I'm thinking of it, mm-hmm. I, I think that's, you know, going to be a, a barrier. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it's, I'm really interested to see over the next like five to 10 years. This is the kind of thing where it's like, man, oh, I wish we paid attention more in epidemiology or as you were <laughs> saying, had more, eventually have a epidemi- epidemiologist want to come in and speak with us. But the, I, I think it is really cool how we, the thing is this whole mosquito thing, right? It's been around since like 2000. All right, let's go into our Oma sarcoma. We haven't really, I feel like we haven't had one for like an episode or two. So why don't you start? Yeah, so mine actually go together. Uh, my Oma is, I'm going to Colorado. So. Okay. Yay. Yeah, I'll be going Colorado. with you. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll meet up and say hello again. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it since I am a little bit more partial to Colorado weather in general. Yeah, you like cooler weather. You like the cold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's something that I, it was kind of a badly needed trip. So, you know, in that sense, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the sarcoma that goes along with it is part of the trip is a snowboarding, mm-hmm. a little couple of days snowboarding in the, the mountains. I am so out of shape that I've made the decision to skip snowboarding <laughs> this year just because I don't want to like break my arm. <laughs> and honestly, I almost should have made that decision last year just because it was like, I was not controlling my board as, as well as I should have. Um, and it's it hard to just from- Around. No, I mean, it was, it was something that I, I just haven't been working out as much as I should for the type of muscles you need to snowboard. And so okay. this year I was just like, I don't, I don't want to risk it. I've got, you know, not the time in my life got that I want too much on the line. Yeah. yeah. So it's something that that's kind of the only major bummer, but okay. it's still gonna be awesome to just there. Oh, I've to- totally hear the slopes and you know, my well, wife's you- going to be snowboarding. So it'll, it'll be good. You don't want to risk breaking those podcasting arms of yours. You know, we, we, we need that. Need too much. Let's, let's hear it. That's cool. Uh, my Oma. So as of today, and of course this episode is not going to be out for a little while, but as of today, February 22nd, 2024, my sister had given birth to my new nephew. So uh, I've mentioned my sister before. She's actually a veterinarian as well. Ross graduate. Uh, graduated right before she left the island essentially just as I went to the island so she's got a couple years on me um so everything was healthy very smooth um so I'm happy for her and we have another member of the family so he's gonna be closer to yeah Mika's obviously she's six months literally as of today or tomorrow and so they're like six months apart and my other sister is due next month so no 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 she had sorry she had a kid last month (laughs) <laughs> everyone's 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 born now yeah we're all we're all set the whole, too many babies too many to babies so yeah we're that's, we that's awesome. they're all they're all very close in age so it's it's super super awesome and you know you're we're going to colorado of course for a wedding and after the wedding you're going to be sticking in colorado but i'm going to be heading over to san francisco to see my friends and family so i can meet my new nephews and everyone can meet my daughter for the first time so that's that's really cool i'm i'm really excited about that the sarcoma, everything's related to my daughter now. All the good things and bad things. So I mean, you expect that at this point, right? Like yes. That's, that's how it goes. <laughs> very, very first world country thing. But again, we're on a platform where we can share our feelings to be heard, right? And to be acknowledged. That's all that matters. All that matters. So I, I bought a new foam, like playground mat thing it's just a bunch of like shapes and foam anyone has a parent who anyone, sorry anyone who is a parent knows what i'm talking about and there's like they come in like maybe seven or eight different of these large foam shapes geometrical shapes and you can build them into forts or anything like that i i, I got that for her which is awesome should be really more of an oma but then two weeks ago i bought her like one of those little foldable gymnastic mats just to kind of help her with her dexterity and her body strength and her core strength. Now I don't know what to do with that. And I just got it like two weeks ago. And I, I got it from Amazon so I can return it, but I threw away the box. So they're like, you need okay. to do your original packaging, which it's fine. I just had to get a box for it. But the thing's kind of awkwardly shaped. It's like a you know two foot by six foot thing. Well, once it's folded, it's like two by two, but I don't have a box that can fit it. So I can't really return it unless I guess I pay money to buy a box so anyways yeah we just we're just now having it in the living over. room it's just hanging out there it's a shame you know you hate to waste or not utilize things you buy but this goes into the, our capitalist society and the issues with that but that's for another it's time got a um, i mean do you have any other parents that oh fair a trade i oh, <laughs> don't know they may have something they're trying to get yeah. rid of that you could trade them right I might. I think everyone in like our friends social circle here, they have they either don't have kids or they have kids that are like a little bit too like too old for it. The little playmat that we have is maybe old enough for zero to nine months. And everyone else is there's kids like a year, year and a half. But 
I'm sure I can find someone. That's a good point. I should, I should, I should pass it on to someone who, who might need it more. Worth doing. I mean, if you're going to go to the trouble of trying to buy a box. It's fair. Yeah. Anyways, it's funny how, yeah. I was going to say, it's funny how now everything's so, it's like there's getting stuff shipped to your house that now it's inconvenient that you need to ship it. Great. Right? If you want to return it, like it's not just, I can't well, live like now this. that I wonder you're not able to return it to because I know you can return some stuff like cold boots or stuff but you have to have the original packaging no matter what I just have works. to have it in a box for the most part oh like, so it doesn't have to well they say it does it any box <laughs> they say it does but I've returned things in not the original packaging and it's been fine so I'm just gonna put it in the box do it and see Anyways, that's it for this episode today, guys. <laughs> a little bit shorter, which sometimes I think is a little bit nicer. You know, I, I've, I've listened to podcasts sometimes and it's, free. you know, I have to kind of prepare myself for an hour long one. So in yeah. this scenario, hopefully we learned something today. If not, just kind of enjoyed uh, just kind of learning a little bit about, well, just hearing about how mosquitoes are currently being treated in society or globally. Poorly. Uh, we'll catch you guys next week. All right. Everyone take care. See you later.